Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Skip Reimer. I'm the Executive Director of Events and Communications here at the Milken Institute. On behalf of all of us at the Institute, welcome to the 17th Annual Milken Institute Global Conference. You can applaud, sure, that's fine. Now, if you've been to Global Conference before, welcome back. We're delighted to see you. If this is your first global conference, well, all I can say is buckle your seat belts. We have a packed conference from this morning's stellar opening panel on the global economy all the way through to Wednesday's closing panel on leadership. Now this year we have another record number of speakers, 650 speakers on 160 sessions focused on some of the biggest challenges we face from the economy to health to education, energy, finance, and much more. And one of the reasons we're here this week is to help find solutions to some of these challenges. Now, details about these panels and all panels can be found in the printed program you received upon registration, but also on the Global Conference app. If you've not downloaded the Milken Institute Global Conference app, I urge you to do so. It has videos and photos, everything you need to know about the conference. Now, a couple of notes. Uh, we are at capacity again this year. And what that means is there will be times when some panels you want to go to will be full. And in advance, I apologize for that, but the fire marshal does require us to close the doors once all seats are taken. There's no standing. So you are free to go to any session where there is room, uh, but if there is a particular panel you want to go see, I just encourage you to get there early to ensure yourself a seat. Uh, another reminder that we require uh, tickets for lunch if you did not receive a ticket in your registration packet, uh, please go to the Lunch Ticket Concierge, which is located at the conference registration area. Uh, one other note, uh, we have significantly ratcheted up our social media uh, this year, and you'll see, for instance, a live Twitter feed on plasma screens throughout the hotel, and we encourage you to join those discussions and follow us at hashtag 2014GC. Uh, we are delighted that you are here. And we look forward to speaking with as many of you as possible this week. Uh, please have a wonderful time, and thank you for joining us. And now I'd like to introduce the moderator of our opening panel, a good friend of the Institute, and the, and the best damn Scotsman I know, the CEO of Principal Global Investors, Jim McCoggin. Jim? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, and thank you, Skip. And it's very exciting to be here at another Milken Institute Global Conference. Uh, for those of us of curious disposition, it has to be one of the highlights of the year to hear such uh, good people and, th and, th and thoughtful and well-informed people talking about different topics. Uh, I know I'm going to get uh, new ideas out of this conference, and I hope all of you do. Uh, this is a terrific panel. Um, I'm honored and privileged to be sitting with these gentlemen. Uh, I won't make a lengthy introduction because there are biographies in the conference program. But to my far right, we have Terry Duffy, who's the executive chairman of the CME, so here in from Chicago. Uh, next on, in line and uh, second from the right is Alex Friedman, who's the global chief investment officer of UBS. I think given that role, if there's a topic that we dry up on, I might turn to Alex because <laughs> I think he knows about most things. Not that the rest of the panel don't. Um, to my immediate right is Joshua Harris, of, uh, Chief Investment Officer of Apollo, um, Apollo Global Management, so uh, I think you're going to be called on on a lot of topics too. To my left we have Alan Howard, the uh, Chief Investment Officer and co-founder of Brevin Howard. And last but not least on the far left is Min Zhu, who's the um, <coughs> Deputy Managing Director of the IMF. So a uh, lot of different backgrounds, a lot of different uh, things we can talk about. In the interest of covering some ground over the next hour and a bit, I'd like to start by, since we're talking, the title of the panel is Hoping for Momentum Amid Tepid <coughs> Times. Um, it's been pretty tepid in terms of growth, maybe not in terms of activity and volatility, but um, I would like to start by talking about growth and if we could look at slide two, please.
the slide two. Yes, we've got slide two. The global growth forecast for the current five-year period from the IMF. Um, I think what it shows is that compared with recoveries in the past, if we're still in a recovery, the developed world, the three bars at the right, are pretty tepid. Maybe the word in the title, tepid, doesn't appeal, appear so much to, ma to match the emerging markets on the left. But I think it's an interesting pattern. 3% growth in the US. Maybe you'd like to start on the US. Uh, any uh, particular thoughts on that? Joshua. Yeah, so the US, um, if you look last year, grew at uh, 1.9%. And um, it's the sort of consensus is that it's going to move up to 2.7 or 2.9 uh, this year and next year. And um, if you look at the first quarter, actually, it was 1.4, uh, 1.5 percent. So the U.S., uh, you know, you, while it says 3 percent on the graph, truthfully, the U.S. hasn't even grown at 3 percent. It's really growing more at, you know, 1.5 to 2 percent. I think, I think it is likely to grow at 3 percent um, <clears throat> because, um, you know, you, you've got, you can just look at the metrics and look at retail sales and um, the uh, cutbacks that the government uh, experienced last year, you're not going to anniversary in those. So if you were to back those out, the U.S. is really growing more like 25 to 3 percent. So, um, it, you know, I, I don't think, you know, at a 3 percent growth rate um, for an economy the size of the U.S., I don't think, I, I, I would characterize that as a reasonable and sustainable growth rate. So I think Tepid's probably, um, you know, probably too negative of a scenario. So I'd say, um, you know, three, I, I think, the, I think you, the U.S. will reach a 3% growth rate. Um, I think we're going to look at a reasonable, uh, benign economic climate. Um, you know, the, the, the Federal Reserve, um, you, know, it, you know, continues to have a lot of flexibility in terms of its ability to, you know, pump money into the system, and that will cushion the U.S. Um, the energy sector um, is, continues to be very, very robust. Uh, consumers are starting to spend, businesses are starting to spend, uh, confidence ratios are going up in the U.S. Our, our portfolio at Apollo is about um, just under 0.5 percent of U.S. GDP, and when we look at uh, the growth in our portfolio heading into the second quarter, we are seeing this acceleration from, uh, you know, one and change to high twos to 3 percent. And so I think the U.S. will continue to be a very big uh, engine in the global economy. Um, one of the things you could get concerned about in the U.S. is that the uh, current expansion is just about five years old. And if you go back and look at historic expansions, um, that's about the average of when there's another recession. Uh, and so you might look at that and say we're getting long in the tooth, and particularly in certain cyclical industries, you might uh, be concerned about uh, investing in those industries. But I'd say that when you um, that's probably not the right analysis in the sense that, and, that's, and that, those are issues that people bring up. Um, that, that's not the right analysis in, in the case of the U.S., though, as when you look at uh, the, the sort of a, the uh, coming out of this last recession, uh, this has been about the slowest the U.S. has recovered. So when you look at uh, many, many metrics, um, you know, I don't think we're close to a recession in the U.S. We probably have, you know, two to four, two to five years of sort of reasonably moderate growth uh, to go in the U.S. So pretty optimistic from you, Joshua, and with 0.5 percent of GDP in your portfolio companies, I guess you've got a pretty good measure of GDP uh, in yeah. real time as you look around. Um, yeah. But Min, um, Joshua cited uh, monetary easing as one of the drivers of growth. How does it look from the IMF point of view? These are your numbers and, uh, you know, to me, they look a bit optimistic over to the left, but uh, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on what the drivers are. Well, thank you. Uh, we forecast the U.S. will have a 2.7% uh, GDP growth rate this year, roughly 3% for next year. The main drivers is obvious. The first issue is not come from monetary policy, rather the fiscal drag is declining. I think this is very important. This, this year is roughly half percentage of GDP, uh, which create you know, uh, quite a bit of room for the aggregate demand. And also, housing sectors uh, continue recovering. <coughs> Household uh, consumption is uh, strengthening. Uh, those are all, all good. I think those things uh, really need uh, uh, a good, from aggregate side, uh, 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 a recovery uh, for the U.S. economy now. Um, 
the, the real issue is uh, we talk about the, the recession, as Josh mentioned uh, uh, that. I think when we say U.S. have a quite a strong growth rates, but still the growth rates under the potential growth rates. And uh, if you're looking for the U.S. GDP level today compared with roughly 2007, it's roughly only 3 4% higher than that so in five years of horizon. So overall, the growth is still relatively weak. And what's for that? The first is the private sector investments are still weak. I think that's is, uh, that's is a big issue. So, and uh, um, you don't see a strong supply side. I think that's issues. And also, you see the fiscal side of things are getting better. But uh, if you're looking for the medium term and the long term, and the fiscal consolidation is still needed because unfound uh, liability is still quite a big. I think those things will sort of balance the growth momentum in the next few years for U.S. economy. So. Uh Fairly concurrent with uh, Joshua, but um, perhaps more concern on the fiscal and the investment side. How do you see that, Alex? Well, I think you're, the way you started the, the tepid word, um, maybe we need to unpack that a little bit because I don't disagree with the numbers that, that we're, we just put out there, but the question is what returns will look like. So the underlying economic growth, I think we have some consensus on. The returns probably will be pretty tepid for investors, uh, and that's largely not so much because of what the economics look like, it's because of the strange results we saw over the last five years, which was uh, uncorrelated so much to economics and driven by central bank policy. So as central bank policy normalizes, we go back to the world where earnings growth largely defines at least risk asset returns. Mm -hmm. And earnings growth in the U.S., I, I personally think, will be about 6 to 8 um, percent, heavily dependent on uh, the, the return story will be heavily dependent on CapEx and whether we see that picking up. And, I think we have been uh, in the last month, which is good news. Uh, it should stimulate the virtuous cycle, more hiring, more spending, et cetera. Um, but I don't expect this to be a blowout return year. Yeah. And on, I yeah, think. I was going to say, like, that's a, I mean, just to follow up on that. So I think people sometimes mix um, economic growth and economic forecasting and returns, and so um, to underscore what Alex is saying, the quantitative easing and the excess money and the lower interest rates have driven pricing up of assets, uh, all, almost all financial assets, to beyond you know, what their intrinsic value might be. So even though we can all <clears throat> chat about uh, the benevolent growth environment that exists in the U.S., and to a lesser extent globally, but um, um, you know, the, the ability to make money on that, the ability to invest wisely on that is very, very challenging right now because you're starting at a point in the valuation cycle that is very, very aggressive. And so, you know, it's a time to be cautious. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, certainly we, are, we at Apollo are being cautious. Uh, we're going slow. And in, in order to make money in today's environment, notwithstanding the interesting growth uh, environment in the U.S. Uh, and, and relatively predictable growth, um, you know, you got to be very, you got to go get into those sectors that are, for whatever reason, depressed on a valuation standpoint, because almost every asset is overvalued. And uh, on the topic, though, of overvalued assets driven by uh, monetary growth and easy <coughs> monetary policies, um, Alex and Joshua both talked about that. Um, isn't one of the interesting things right now, though, Alex, that monetary policies from the different central banks are much less coordinated. They're diverging. We got the Fed tightening. It will probably tighten again at this week's meeting. We'll see some more tapering, I guess. Um, BOJ, ECB have got to go into quantitative easing if they're going to keep their economies going. How do you think that might play out? <clears throat> I, I, Jim, I think this is a, criti a critical point uh, because we've gotten used to a world where basically you've had Fed policy dictating what at least developed market policy looks like. Now, if I put the kind of spectrum, metaphorical spectrum up, you probably got, as you said, Japan most likely to ease. On the other end of the spectrum, you've got England and Canada probably most likely to tighten. Somewhere in the middle, you've got the ECB and the Fed probably going in opposite directions now, uh, as, you, as you suggest. That creates a very different environment to invest in than we've had for the last five years. Yeah. Uh, Jim, can I come back one yes, point? Yes, of course, man. Uh, a slight different uh, uh, views uh, from, from uh, Alex. I agree with Josh. I think uh, the valuation is very tricky because the market is leaving away, shifting away, let me put it that way, from a sort of liquidity-driven market to the growth-driven market. Mm -hmm. But we're still in the liquidity-driven market. We're not in the growth-driven market yet. 
the market start pricing in now. So it is a very broad asset repricing across all different classes of assets now. It's very different from the May 22nd last year, which is very much repricing between the emerging market and the advanced economy. This time, it's really uh, the, the, the overall uh, repricing. Um, the process is not even. It's, it's very tricky because it depends on the central bank policy. People understand and see the change now, but uh, some will move in, some will don't. We see the market, it's very interesting because everybody has its own yield curve. It's very much on the, the first short part, 10 years, the last uh, two, three years. But on the middle, everybody has a different shape. So it's very interesting. So I would say the market can be very sentimental, can be very sensitive. And the valuation is a tricky issue. Yeah. The second issue is go back to uh, the central bank policies. I would say, although we're talking about tapering, but overall, the central bank is still on the expansionary phase. In the Fed, the tapering just is slow down. The purchase process, overall Fed balance is still on the expanding side, just slowing down. So globally, ECB is also expanding now. I mean, we made further with QEs. Japan is on QE side, and the US has just slowed the, the speed, but still on the expansionary side. So it's an overly monetary policy still on, on the positive side on the mark, market and the growth at all. <coughs> The real issue changes really will see what Fed will do after this tapering. I think that's the key issue. Then we'll see how this monetary policy in the conflict issues are whether it will impact the market as well. So uh, we've got a reasonable, reasonably positive consensus on the US, which may worry you, by the way. But um, <laughs> nevertheless, we need to think about various issues and topics. Slide two. Sh uh, going back to it, showed the Eurozone with a five-year growth rate of 1%. Um, to me, that feels fairly heroic, given it was more like zero uh, over the last five years. Um, the Eurozone seems to find it very difficult to get any real growth going. The fact that their banking system hasn't been recapitalized like the US, uh, where's the credit growth going to come from? Um, what's going to happen to bring unemployment down from its extremely high levels around most of the Eurozone. Um, can the Eurozone move on and uh, move away from zero growth? And will it need a policy change? Uh, Alan, I think you may have some thoughts on this. First of all, I'd like to uh, just comment on the last discussion about um, of course. Uh, central bank uh, policy being different in different parts of the world. The last time we really had this situation was in '94, when the Fed and the Bundesbank both went in opposite directions in the same week. So I think we have to see, uh, I think there's going to be tremendous opportunity across the globe given the diff divergent policies um, between the major central banks. And although uh, we still have accommodative policy, the US tapering is going to be over by September, and the ECB hasn't started any QE at all, and may not. And, and this, um, in terms of the balance sheet of the, of the ECB, it's come dramatically reduced where the excess liquidity now is back to what it was pre uh, around the 08 time. So uh, I think it's, it's not clear how much uh, accommodative policy we will get globally. Anyway, going into Europe, I think that this is a once um, one, a real big chance for Europe here to get some, to potentially get, uh, have a proper growth cycle by fixing the banks. The mistake that happened really uh, from Maastricht was that from, from, from 99 onwards, they have never really had a proper banking union and never had um, the banks sorted out. Whilst the US did that straight away in 09, in 08, 09 after the crisis, the Europeans have done nothing <coughs> on, really regarding banks. But finally, uh, they have in the last two or three years um, getting their act together. And the big uh, thing for me is that so that's what's going to change this year and going forward, specifically that the ECB is going to become the main regulator this year. Once it becomes the main regulator, it will override the, local, the national regulators and will potentially stop the segmentation that, and ring fencing that's happened post-08. So I think that's a key issue. And the only thing the ECB is really focusing on is that much more than cutting rates or QE. QE is a, is a consequence of um, wanting to fix the banks first. Um, and, and we have to see how that process happens. And on the assumption that it's a genuine process and there is some um, bank uh, recapitalization, which we're seeing already in certain countries, and uh, some banks are uh, being let go, um, I'm very confident that he'll, the ECB will get it right uh, in terms of allowing, um, of getting those yields lower 
um, in specifically in the SMEs of the periphery and for those better corporates in some of those southern European countries to access capital at the correct rate. And if they get that right, then they have a chance for, of, a, of a potential cycle of growth. Notwithstanding all the issues that you said, which is they have unemploy high unemployment, they still have high debt levels. But without getting the banks fixed, they're never going to get out of this mess. Yes, and so Alan, Alan in that, if I understand you correctly, you're suggesting that the part, a big part of the bank fix is a unitary banking regulation under the ECB, which of course means a unitary <coughs> bank rescue and bank resolution system. The opposition to that up till now has been from the Germans who perceive that that means they'll have to foot everyone's bills. Do you really think that'll get through the German political okay. system? So I think there's two things. One is I don't think we're going to get a, a deposit insurance scheme. Mm -hmm. I think part of the reason for the Germans against what's going on is, not, uh, is, is, what, is what you mentioned, but also that if we get a unified banking system, then they're the lose, potential losers in the fact that banks across the rest of Europe will be able to get access to deposits mm -hmm. from Northern Europe at a better rate. And therefore, that's part of the reason why they're not as keen as they want. But mm -hmm. once ECB is the main regulator, mm -hmm. he, he, they are in charge of all the national regulators, including, including Baffin, and they can, if they want, change, uh, uh, can do what they want at that point. So I think over time you'll see northern bank deposits moving um, across, across the zone, and uh, as well as lower rates for SMEs, uh, given there's only one regulator. So the main thing to watch for really on the EU, if I hear you rightly, Alan, is the coordination, integration of the banking system, which you believe <coughs> will happen, though it may take time. That's right, yes. With that, you may get, given uh, the low um, inflation rate that we're seeing, below one, um, you may get some other monetary easing to ensure that there, as he's made public, that, he'd like, uh, that the currency um, potentially comes, uh, weakens a little bit to, in, to help in the process to ensure that we don't get too much of a deflationary or more disinflation in Europe. So I think you could get a mixture of rate cuts and QE, possibly, uh, but this will really be um, on the assumption that the currency doesn't come down and the banks are fixed. It, yeah. Interestingly, while the US, we all sat up here and said that relatively predictable 3% growth, a very tough climate to invest in, Europe is the opposite. Their growth is truly tepid, you know, flattish. But because of the deleveraging of this enormous banking sector, and just to give you a sense, um, U.S. and Europe have about the same size uh, GDP, about 16 trillion. The U.S.'s banking sector is 12 trillion. Europe's banking se sector, depending on who you talk to, is 50 to 60 trillion. So, same size economies, but Europe's banking sector is massively larger. Yeah. And, this, and our capital markets are massively larger. And our capital markets are massively larger. And so the deleveraging of the banks in Europe will override, will dwarf mm -hmm. um, any, anything else really going on. And the market's ability to absorb the banks getting smaller and getting out of some of these risky businesses uh, will create you know, the arbitrage, a valuation arbitrage, where you can actually make interesting investments across Europe in all kinds of different assets that the banks will be slowly exiting, um, whether it be consumer loans, whether it be mortgages, mm -hmm. whether it be commercial property loans, companies, uh, high yield, distressed. So Europe, even though it's not going to grow, um, is actually a very interesting place to invest if you can get in front of this massive change in the banking sector. And when you've got this, this sort of excess liquidity uh, created by all the central banks, the key to actually playing that is to get in front of these large mega trends. And this is probably the biggest one in the world, yep. the deleveraging of the European banks. Now, we seem to be talking mostly in the first piece of this debate about monetary policy. And uh, there's a lot of talk about you know, the end result of monetary policy, interest rates, and when interest rates will normalize. Uh, if we can bring up slide six, I find this uh, an interesting, it's the, if it's the right one, it's the 10-year yield. Yep, US Treasury 10-year yield, a 50-year chart. Um, I look at this chart and say, what does normalize mean? This is not a stationary chart. There's no mean reversion that I can see here. And uh, so what does normalizing of interest rates look like? And what can we see in the current structure of the banking system, the economy, and central bank policies that might tell us when interest rates have normalized? What will that look like over the next few years? I think, Terry, from your standpoint, you've got a few thoughts on that. Well, I have a few thoughts only from a selfish uh, standpoint, because obviously our largest product set is an interest rate. So 
when we say what is a normalized rate environment, I think you bring up a good point. It's hard to determine what that is. We do know that it's something less than zero. And when we look around the world, that's all we're seeing is zero. So I think anywhere on an uptick is going to become more normalized rate when we get out of the, the tapering and uh, the QE activity. So I'm a, I'm a big believer that most economies, at least from my personal perspective, have done better in a normalized rate environment, whatever that may be. I think um, all businesses are reflective of interest rates. No matter what you do, whether you're in energy or any type of commerce, rates are going to have an impact on your business. So, um, you know, I, don't, I just think that Japan showed us something very uh, telling through the 90s that a zero interest rate environment was not good for their economy. I don't think it's good for the U.S. or Europe, and I think we're going to have an uptick in rates, and I don't think that's a bad thing. <clears throat> I think that when you look to lend money to people, you need to lend it to them with the confidence that they're actually going to try and pay you back, and they're not going to try to pay you back with an asset that is supposed to appreciate when it went the other way. And uh, that's what happened in 08 and 09, and I don't know why anybody's surprised by that, but that's exactly what will happen when you lend money to people with a pulse. Um, I'm a, a big believer that rates are going to get back into a more uh, two to three percent, and that to me will be a more normalized, um, but the question is for how long? Yeah. And normalized rates might be at 12 months and not five years. Yeah, so if I hear you right, um, Terry, that could mean three years out when they've quote normalized, you might have a flat yield curve at three percent. Correct. That seems to me pretty rational, though there are a lot of people I come across to say, of course it's going to five or six percent. That's been the norm throughout our careers, it's going to come back. I personally side with Terry uh, that rates will probably stay lower than most people think for quite a long time. I'd be interested if any of the panel have different views on that. Well, well, well the 10-year treasury is 260. The market would say it'll be 440 five years from now. Um, I think the Fed has informed us that they're going to raise rates. The, the, their view of short-term rates is that by 2016, and they put this out, short-term rates will be two and a quarter, and that their long-run sort of Fed funds rate is four. Mm -hmm. So the question is, you know, how do you have a three or four percent treasury if the short-term rate is ultimately four? And so I, I, I think, I guess, I, I think rates could stay in that sort of lower zone, three to four percent for some period of time. but. Eventually, um, as the economy uh, approaches full employment, you're going to start to get inflationary wage pressures. They're going to bring short-term rates up. And so I, I think that um, I think rates are likely to, I think the market is underestimating mm -hmm. ultimately where long-term rates will be. And so the debate we're all having here is really a debate on when does the U.S. economy hit full capacity. And I think they've told us. They think that's in the end of 2015, or early 2016. So if you, I, I think that's where, that sort of time frame is where you should expect treasuries to rise, you know, much closer to, you know, five, five and a half percent, like where they've historically been as the Fed puts the brakes on the economy. So you'd take the over compared with me and Terry, so. I would. What would you think, Alex? Well, actually, I wanted to comment on uh, the, the expression Josh just used, full employment, because from where I sit, that's one of the unknowns out there right now, even if you listen to Janet Yellen. And it, it, it is a tough one to have clarity on because it has to do with demographics. It has to do with jobs that may or may not exist in a globalized economy. And so it's very difficult uh, from a policymaking perspective, I'd be curious on, with your views on this, to know exactly when you're going to hit full employment because we don't know what full employment is anymore. And that does suggest that the risk could be that we see a more inflationary environment faster uh, than we expect which is not my base case, but it's something I think we might want to talk about. Yeah. Well, the normalization, uh, James, you have a very good question. The first is, is what normal, right? What norm? I right. mean, is this go back to the previous is the year 2007 or new norm, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, this is a big issue, so I think yep. uh, the answer is not all clear at all. I think the first is, the second issue is go back to all the different central banks that they have, do have a different phase of monetary policy easing. And uh, so, the normalization can take a very different approach across different central banks. Yes. I think the Fed will move first, the ECB is still on, on the easing side, and the uh, BOJ and it's still on that side. So that will create the market volatilities as well. So I think that's very important. The third issue is when you talk about normalization, you talk about interest rates, but you have to think about how the Fed manages balance sheets. Mm -hmm. They are linked, but they are not necessarily being the same thing. 
And uh, so you have to see how this balance is to be normalized. I mean, you think about the Fed balance is from 0 0.7 trillion, roughly seven years ago, today to 3.8 trillion, right? Would Fed stay that size, go further, go back, well to stop? I think that's the key issue, so-called normalization. I think that is issue much more uh, uh, invisible uh, than the interest rates. Mm -hmm. Then the job issue also a uh, big concern, Alex mentioned about that. I think the uh, unemployment number in a clarity of answers number is challenging enough. But if you bring the financial stability into the policy framework, it will make things even more challenging. Right? Because it's more difficult to measure financial stability. Yeah. But now, obviously, financial stability is a concern of central banks today because they do have a dual mandate. You know, in, in addition to target the, the, the price levels, uh, uh, inflation level, but also job as well, but also on the financial uh, instability as well. So financial stability will be more challenging issues, more difficult to measure, and make communication between the central bank and the market more challenging as well. I think you do as a serviceman by, dis by reminding us to look back at the size and change in central bank balance sheets rather than purely <coughs> what tends to get the headlines, which is the activities that affect monetary base in the short term. And I, I think that that sort of almost ties back to um, Alan's earlier point about Europe needs a banking union but may not get QE. Uh, does that affect your thoughts of where interest rates might settle, Alan? No. Oh. Uh, in Europe? Yeah. Um, it, it, well, first of all, on the, on the US, I think that the first comment to make is that uh, there are two things I'm looking at for deciding where we end up in um, back-end rates. Is one is the pace of monetary uh, tightening that may or that will happen at some point, and whether uh, the central bank, which has got some, has got to look at financial stability as well as inflation and unemployment, how it decides within the diverse committee um, what, whether to hike slightly earlier or slightly later, I not hike until it really sees some inflation coming through and that may take a while and therefore Nairo, they may hike with a Nairo a lot lower than the 5.4 that they're saying at the moment is the midpoint of where they see for unemployment. That's the first thing. The second thing is in their projections they are, produ they are assuming in 2016 is Russia's uh, uh, real rates of zero and, uh, and that may change as well um, because if we start to see proper growth uh, which may happen post QE, then I bet that people will start to rethink re, re about where real rates should be in that world. And to some extent, I think people's expectation of short term real rates is based on what they're seeing today. So that's, those are the two things that we have to watch to determine where those back end yields go. Yeah. I think that Europe will need the both. Mm -hmm. They need the banking union, yeah. they need the QE. So you'd be worried if they don't get the QE? Yeah, I think that because the growth is so weak yeah. and uh, the unemployment rate yes. is way, way high. It's very fragile. Yes. Uh, they are moving around the corner now, which is good news, but in terms of structure issues, in terms of transmission uh, of monetary policy, I think the QE is very important for Europe as well. So yeah. I agree with uh, what Joshua says. In, in this country, if you're looking for the whole financial sectors, two-thirds are capital market, one-third of banking sector. But in Europe, two-thirds of the banking sector, one-third of the capital market. Yeah. So make sure the banking sector functions well is absolutely important. But only banking se sector function well is not enough. You need a QE. You need to provide the liquidity through the banking system getting to the real economy. So both sides are needed, but also additionally, structural reform like a labor market reform, SME reform is also needed. So in, in Europe, so in Europe, I think the key, as has been said on, on regarding QE, I think the question is what type of QQE and how targeted it is. Mm -hmm. It's no good if they're going to start to buy, uh, let's say they buy German bonds or something, what good does that do? Yep. That could potentially reduce, um, uh, reduce all rates, but it's not clear to what extent mm -hmm. that happens. So I think the question there is the size and the targeting. And they've made it clear they want to try and target certain assets, um, which are more private, as private securities and therefore won't have uh, less political headaches in terms of whether that's called debt, debt, debt financing yeah, of course or not. The political headaches come when, they, when the private securities are threatening to default and they're on the official balance sheet and I, I don't know how they will cope with that down the road. But that's down the road. So, um, so um, politicians yeah. don't care. Um, <laughs> so, but they're, but they're, at the moment there's not enough private assets for them to buy yeah. uh, to affect. Uh, so I think it's more, um, uh, not the si in Europe we have to work about, we see if it's the size or really just the targeting and get, get those rates down. Yeah, my only point, we're jumping around a bit, but my only point on 10-year rates, and it goes back to the point that Alex was, or long-term rates is, the Fed has been buying half of the 10-year Treasury, if you look at it over a period of time. So literally, 
Um, we're not even through, they're, they're tapering, but we're still adding to the monetary, their, their balance sheet. Mm -hmm. So not only do they have to stop adding to their monetary balance sheet, they then have to reverse at some point reinvesting and ultimately bring that balance sheet down. They've got a lot of flexibility on that, uh, but the technicals have really reduced the 10-year treasury to where it would, it would truly be trading on a fundamental basis because you've got the U.S. government on, on, on both sides of the trade. Secondly, you know, the Fed really has had a free lunch in terms of its ability to pump a lot of money into the system, but there's very little inflationary pressure in the U.S. today as a result of the fact that the recession was so deep and so broad, and we're now just recovering. We're almost back to the employment base we had in 07, almost back. So as we, so we're, we're now getting into treacherous waters. It's going to get a little more complicated, and I think the minute that you see any hint of inflation in the U.S. economy, um, you're going to see a significant pullback by the Fed, and that's going to push up rates. And so if you look at the 10-year Treasury and where it's priced now, it's really priced as if none of that happens. Yeah. And so I feel like it is really, uh, it's really too low. Well, I, I think one of the untold stories of the last five years is how much the Fed has inadvertently furthered the income divide problem in the United States. Because what they've done, yeah. They pushed down fixed income rates. Everyone went to risk assets. Stock markets did very well. So who, who holds financial assets? The well-off. The median income, as we know, is about the same as it was in 79. The Gini coefficient in an hour north of New York City is worse than Zimbabwe. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Fed, I, I've, I've talked to central bankers about this, and they basically said, yep, this was not our intent, obviously, but it was an unintended side effect. Yeah, and that's a, that's a structural weakness in the economy. But you know, to challenge your point, Joshua, uh, I tend to feel, and this will we'll probably get into this later, I tend to feel that commodities are now in structural oversupply because there's been so much investment in energy and metals particularly. If they're in structural oversupply, and with the globalization of manufacturing, manufactured goods are in structural oversupply, I tend to wonder who's got the pricing power and where, where does the inflation really come from? You any thoughts on that? Yeah, well, well, I'd say that if you go back t to the last 10 years, the quote super cycle, you had the economies growing at 4 or 5% uh, globally. And so everything was in structural deficit. And so commodity producers, by and large, almost across the board, there's a lot of correlation, had aggressive pricing power, and there was commodity inflation pressure. I'd say now you've got an economy growing at 2 to 3%. And I think it's much more idiosyncratic. In some cases, you have markets in oversupply, a la natural gas. In some cases, you have markets um, such as oil, which are in structural deficit, and so there's some pricing power. So I think you've gone from a, a market environment where there's idiosync that where there's across the board pricing power in commodities and there's inflation to a market where you have to look market by market and, and make your own view. It, it, outside of the energy markets and the metals markets, everything is really, when you look at uh, ag and metals, it all comes back to what is the growth rate in China. Mm -hmm. 50, 60, 70 percent of the demand in those products is based on the growth rate in China. We all know that the growth rate in China is slowing a bit, but it's not falling off a cliff. So I guess I would say that um, I'm, I, I take a much more balanced view of your point. And, the other point I'd make is, particularly in the U.S., um, the U.S. really is not driven by commodity price um, inflation. What the U.S. is really driven by is uh, labor and wage inflation. Seventy percent of the U.S. economy is consumer, and the U.S. is much more balanced from a commodity point of view and getting more balanced all the time in energy. And so what's going to drive the U.S. inflation is less this commodity price situation and much more... Um, you know, the tightening of the labor markets, what will drive the emerging markets a little bit more and what will drive China, certainly, and the inflation in China will be this commodity price inflation situation that you're discussing. So with yeah, I agree with Josh, the first half. I, I think you're absolutely uh, uh, right. If the inflation rates jump out, the Fed will quickly call back. I and mean, this is obviously one potential risk. You're absolutely right. But uh, you're also right, in the U.S., inflation rates is not driven by commodity, although the oil price is a big chunk of the whole thing, but very much driven by the wager. <clears throat> I mean, if you're looking for the wager bill now, wage increased very slowly in the past few years. Exactly, Alex mentions income distribution issues also chip in. 
So in that sense, it's hard to see U.S. will have uh, inflation pick up quickly and uh, sort of, you know, you just stable, uh, sustained for a while. I, I think in that sense, uh, yeah. the monetary policy probably will stay uh, relatively uh, yeah. easy. As always, you can make different cases from the data. I'd like to slow, show slide nine, which really is a graph of, if it's the right one, it's the graph of the commodity super cycle. Yep, commodity price index. And you can see there were two peaks with a little bit of a trough because of the global financial crisis. But since the second peak, until a little kick upwards recently, which I think we might get on to, um, it's been downward for the reasons we've been discussing. Uh, how do you see this developing, Terry? I know you're right in the thick of it in the commodity markets. I think this chart actually emulates the U.S. equity markets, if you look at it, and that's exactly what's going on here. So it's a supply-demand equation. You know, people have a different staple of food when uh, the prices are at one price and they have a different uh, taste for that food when it's in a different price. When you look at the price of corn, you look at 2011, 2012, we're talking about corn trading at $7, or $7.5 a bushel, beans trading around $14 a bushel. You talk about the energy markets. The energy markets haven't done a thing in the last four years outside of if Putin decides to make a comment, then they'll go up $5 a barrel. And if he doesn't say anything, they go down $5 a barrel. So oil has been between $90 and $110 a barrel literally for the last five years. So that hasn't been a major effect. We've had a big deflation out of the, 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 the precious metals markets. And this rally that we see here in 2011, 2012 at the peak was basically driven by the agricultural sector, in my opinion, for what I saw the prices. And it, there's no secret, the drop off in 13 and 14 was to what you said earlier. I'm not sure who said it, but with the drop off in Asia, you yeah. can really simu it just emulates the, the, the market dramatically. Well, first of all, this chart can be very misleading. Um, this is Bloomberg, it's not IMF. I'm happy uh, to see that. I, mean, I like Bloomberg yeah. charts. I like Bloomberg, I have to say. I just did an interview with them. But uh, we the reason is, I mean, you have to decompose the commodity price into two trends. One is the baseline. One is the volatility, right? And the volatility, the baseline is really the trends. If you're looking for the commodity baselines, actually it's on downsides. We see the oil price, we see the, 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 uh, the battle price is uh, uh, iron ores and the copper. So we see uh, food prices is, is really on the downside. So we see the price probably will drop not very much, but still on the downside in the next few years. But if you're looking for the volatilities, given the geopolitical risk, given the different things happen in the different corner of the world, there's quite a big volatility there. So. so the whole trends for the commodity price in the next few years, I would say, the base trends are still on downsides, but volatility is adding up the whole thing. It's not all clear. It depends on how things happen. Yes. No. OK. Um, we've talked about commodities a bit, and it's clearly important. <coughs> but the big, what we haven't talked about yet is the recent big drive, the last few years, big driver of growth, which is emerging market growth. And Emerging markets are both driven by commodities, because many of the emerging markets are commodity-based economies. They're also, as Joshua said earlier, particularly China, driving uh, consumption of commodities. And you know, growth can drive commodity prices upwards. Um, I think it would be interesting to look at maybe chart slide three, which shows the longer-term growth of some of the main emerging markets. And, um, so that's showing China and India uh, against the advanced countries. So you can see there much of the decade was extraordinary growth. It's still fast on the projections. And this is IMF, by the way. This is an IMF chart, yeah, I like it. <laughs> I think it might be over-optimistic, yeah. but it's yeah. IMF. Got to be, got to be right. <laughs> but, uh, and uh, do you want to pick up on this issue? Yes, please, yeah. go ahead. Um, the emerging market growth, I think the, the few things, number one, uh, has been slowed down, actually has been slowed down since 2011. Because 2010 is a really strong rebound, driven by the fiscal stimulus and the response to the crisis. So it is a slowdown. It's not a slowdown since last year. It's really 2011 now. It's going to slow down, the first issue. The second issue is they have, have to adjust to the external environment change, which is financial conditions tightening, liquidity is tightening, interest rates is on upside, and China is slowing down, demand on the commodity also slowed down. I think they have to adjust that. The number three, the macro fundamental deteriorating in the past few years because strong growth. Physical buffer is much smaller, and the current account deficits increase. In some countries, inflation rates also 
uh, very high, so they have to do a macro uh, adjustments as well. But overall, at this moment, I would say emerging market growth has been stabilized. We'll see they probably will stay at these levels and uh, around 4.5% globally and uh, for a while. Obviously, they need to continue to do structural reforms. They need to continue to prepare the further tapering from the Fed and the further tightening of the Fed monetary policy as well. But overall, they do stabilize. Yeah. I, I think in, in EM, one of the mistakes we often make is we lump it together and call it EM. I mean, first, yeah. you've got to separate out China. There's China, and then there's everything else. And then in the everything else category, you have a lot of different stories, very idiosyncratic. But the major story seems to relate in the last five years, no surprise, to what the Fed has done. Mm -hmm. So returns come way down in the U.S. People look for returns. They go to risk assets in the U.S., and they go to the emerging markets. That covered up a lot of need for reform, which wasn't done. So when there's a hiccup around a taper tantrum or something, money starts to flow back. It exposes you know, those who are in the proverbially swimming naked. So you can start to distinguish between which emerging market countries don't run up fiscal and a monetary deficit, and which ones do. You know, as investors, I actually think you can make it simple and say, if you're betting on a recovery in the United States, uh, which we are, which countries do you think will export to the United States where the US consumer starts buying more? And you'll find a fair amount of EM stories that I think have stability and, and um, can give you confidence. Yeah. Um, one of the things that worries me, though, about the emerging markets, and I'm a, you know, I'm pretty bullish long term about the emerging markets generally and about some of the more better selected ones, maybe, maybe China and Brazil rather than Russia and South Africa, but you, know, you have to be Russia. selective. But um, one of the things that concerns me even about the markets I fundamentally long term I'm optimistic for is the credit cycle. You know, we've heard $1.2 trillion, $1 trillion of um, secondary bank loans put into trust vehicles in China in the last three or four years. That's pretty big and could be very disruptive when it unwinds. You've had uh, an enormous increase in credit card receivables and the like in Brazil, very high credit extension to the consumer sector. Um, that feels to me like a slower outlook than the IMF. So I don't know if, uh, if that's a fair comment. Um, Joshua, do you have a feeling on that? Yeah, I mean, look, in, in many of these countries, and particularly the ones that you mentioned, um, the, the, the issue of creditors' rights and, and getting your money back, it looms large. And, the, and there's a lack of a defined legal system, a lack of a defined bankruptcy organization process. So the first question we ask when we lend money is, can we get paid back? If you lend, the, if you lend to the wrong person in China or Brazil, the answer is no, you can't. It doesn't matter what the document yeah, says. Good luck suing them in the Chinese courts. <laughs> Exactly. So I think I, I do think there's been uh, again, as you know, based on I mean, Alex hit it right, which is there was lots of money out there. Um, it needed to go somewhere. There was an arbitrage in rates. It went to, it went blindly into some countries that where people didn't do the work. Um, and as and we're at the beginning of a significant pullback, you know, by the Fed, and that money will come out of EM over time. And those countries that have negative current account deficits, that, are, that have high debt to GDP ratios, are gonna to have to deleverage. And that's gonna be very disruptive in terms of them expanding their productive capacity, putting money into plants, their banking systems. And so you're at, I think you're at the beginning of a pretty difficult point for those countries that have been living beyond their means. And I agree, I would, I would carve China out of that to a large extent because China is so big that it can deal with some of those problems without having to rely on the external capital markets. But if you're in, um, in South Africa or if you're in even Brazil, you know, which is in the middle, um, you, know, you have to rely on the external capital markets. And as people become more discerning, um, you know, they start to focus on these issues. Apollo has, we don't do a lot of business in the emerging markets in terms of credit, even though we're the largest alternative credit manager um, really on the planet. It's, you know, we, that's, we that's actually very telling, Joshua. We do do a lot of business in emerging markets, but it's mostly raising money for investment, not yeah. lending them money. We do, we do that. We yeah. do raise money. <laughs> Yeah. But it's so you'll take the money we'll take, out. We'll not take put money it back in. We'll take money from anywhere. Um, <laughs> yeah. uh, but it, 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 it's it's hard, you know. Until we yeah. can actually get comfortable with the credit risk, 
um, we're not going to lend the money. So it, yeah. it, 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 you know, unfortunately, we, we, we don't follow the money, but a lot of people do. So it's, it's going to yeah. be a, long, a bit of a long road. So Min, we're yep. all taking the under on your numbers. Are you going to defend them? Uh, no, I, I don't think I need to defend them. They should got to be good numbers, right? <laughs> and uh, now that's a question for Josh and for the other, other investors. I mean, to, for the credit uh, boom is the typical phenomenon for the emerging market in the past few years because a lot of capital flow move in and the easy monetary policy domestic accommodating with the capital flow in. So credit is really on the upside now. So deleveraging is a must. I think this is, a, this is very clear. Now, the key issue is when they do delivery by themselves, the key issue is whether those, the f capital flow will leave. We estimate in the past five years, the capital flow moving to the emerging market roughly 1.6 trillion. But among this 1.6 trillion, roughly there's a $407 billion, as I call it extra, the capital flow move into uh, the, the emerging market. That means we assume there's a trend, you know, sort of said to go that way, because of globally quantitative easy monetary policy, so the trends will shift to go further. So there's roughly $470 billion extra capital flow moving to the emerging market. So questions uh, whether this money will stay or will leave. Yes. So Josh, this question for you. Are you going Josh. to stay or you will leave? Yeah. If they stay, I think they will help for emerging market. They do the sort of uh, uh, deleveraging. If they move, obviously, they will make the deleveraging process much more dramatic. I just think a lot of that capital is fast money. Yeah. And, it, and, it's, yes. and it really doesn't know why. It's really there because it's you know, punching up Bloomberg and seeing an arbitrage in rates. Isn't, and it, and it, isn't it the credit that's fast money into emerging markets? The equity investment into emerging markets yes. may not be. Yes. But, but the equity investment, a lot of it is, um, is very, sh I think, short term and, and very vulnerable to um, bad headlines. Yes. I mean, one of the things yeah. we haven't talked about is Russia. Um, mm. I don't know if Please. you want to do that. Oh, now. I do. I, yeah. I think Russia's, Russia's become important, not because it's a big market, but because it's a potential destabilizer. Yeah, and that's exactly the point. Um, and it goes back to where you started this. You can really draw a line between fundamental economics and returns. And a lot of returns are driven by um, the psychology of how investors look <coughs> at risk. And the headlines around Russia right now are, are obviously scary. And if you look at the ingredients and go back to you know, pre-World War I, there's a lot of stuff you could say um, could be a tinderbox that could go in unintended ways. That's on the psychology side, uh, because rational forces should have ultimately prevail if you just go by probabilities, and it's in no one's interest to escalate this from a military perspective. Well, that was true in 1914 as well. Exactly. Um, so that's why I brought it up. But on the other side of this, which is, you know, the fundamental impact for investors, uh, for the global economy, I think we can trace this to oil and basically say if oil is up by 15 or $20 a barrel over a sustained period of time, then we see a true problem that could undermine the European nascent recovery, even the US recovery. That should be unlikely. Um, but Russia is a reminder that geopolitical risk is real, that yeah. we can't predict it in the short term, which is why traders you know, have a hard time. We're all investors, I think, yeah. and we look at things a bit differently. Yeah, well, the, well, if you go further, if you're looking for the, the, the foreign investors, the small and the medium fund, the money is left already, right, in the past roughly nine months. And they're moving a little bit of that. The really is the big guy still there. The concentration becomes the big issue in emerging market now. For example, the copper bonds in emerging market today is 1.2 trillion, 1.4 trillion. It's bigger than US how year bonds market, which is 1.2 trillion now. They very much concentrate the five to six big guys in this country. or. And uh, so the, the question is whether the big guy will stay or leave. Mm -hmm. You know, so, it's interesting that, that? Um, the market, I think, historically has um, ignored geopolitical risk to a large extent mm -hmm. in terms of its, its valuation. And, and I'd say that when you look at volatility measures and risk, risk measures today, they're, they're, they're non-existent. They're at all-time lows. But then you can read the paper, and you know, Russia is probably the biggest evidence of this. But certainly, you know, you've got what's going on in Syria. You have the Iranian nuclear issue. You've got plenty of stuff around China the globe. China and Japan. China and Japan. You've got plenty yeah. of stuff around the globe. And it, what it really is is tail risk. Like, it's yeah. hard to sit right. here hard to invest in and, and say that the probable outcome is that Russia is going to want to attack Lithuania right. or go into a bunch of other countries. 
Um, but at the same time, I don't think there's any valuation of it in the marketplace. Yeah. People are ignoring it totally. And so again, it, it's just another component and characteristic of the easy money environment that we're living in today. Yeah. Which is, which is I, why I'm I think... I'm not sure I'd agree with no. that, Josh, I don't, I don't. actually, because I, I think the increased geopolitical risk on Russia, Ukraine, is the reason, the single most important reason why the US equity market's flat year to date rather than up. And if you think about it, maybe, maybe Russia and Ukraine has a 5% probability of turning really disastrous, whatever that means, Alex described some of the situations. Maybe it's a 5% probability, but mar equity markets would have then. 5% to 50%, that takes you down 3% compared with where you'd otherwise have been. I, I, think that's, I think it's debatable. Earnings were very disappointing in the first quarter. And, oh, not much. And, vol not much. and volatility is still pretty low around yeah. the globe. So, I mean, yeah. it's the risk metrics in the market, I don't think, are picking up. It's hard yeah. to, you know, that, that is one theory, but... Um, but there's an easy way to, I think, answer this, which is if two people held a press conference to announce they were really worried about the world, one was Putin and one was Janet Yellen, yeah. what do you think the markets would react to more? <laughs> yes. Now, part of that is because Russia is a relatively small part of the global economy. Exactly. I mean, people forget that, right? Yeah. So really what matters is the commodity implications. And then you get back to the rational world we live in. And Europe, I mean, I'll, I'll go out on a limb and say they cannot afford to have level three sanctions against energy exports from Russia. It just yeah. won't work. Yeah, so to Joshua's point, Terry, do you think your traders are ignoring the negative tail risk? No, I don't think so at all. I think what we're looking at a lot of this is, you know, you got top line revenue of companies roughly two and a half, three percent, and you got the this of their revenue, and then you look at their appreciation in their stocks in 2013 is up over 30 percent in a lot of the the S and P 500. So you're looking at equity markets having a top line revenue of X and a revenues. Um, inc or the increase in their price by 30 percent, that's a big difference and it's not very sustainable going forward. So I think markets are ebbs and flows. I've been in the business since 1981. What I've noticed is you can look at all the charts you want, you can look at all the forecasts you want, what is what's going on in current events and what you think is going to happen tomorrow because the past isn't going to do you a whole lot of good. Yeah. Um, I think that traders are basically looking at some of the geopolitical risk because they know that's a short-term trade. And that's what happens. I think you're absolutely right when it comes to Russia. I think it's putting a, a damper on the upside of the equity markets right now. And all you got to do is look at what the timing of it, and you can see the turnover a little bit. Okay, guys, if we're legitimately possibly returning to a more aggressive Russia, a, a more of a Cold War scenario where Russia is increasingly menacing its neighbors, that is way more significant than is priced into the markets right now. Definitely. No, and I, I, I just don't, I don't think that the markets yeah. are pr in no. any way, pr I mean, I'm saying on the margin, certainly yeah. like people react to headlines, but just to say that the fundamental, the, the U.S. is pulling back all over the globe. Mm -hmm. You know, our ability to act as a global secure of the peace is, we can't do it anymore. Well, it, and never so was. The, it never was that high. Look at what happened when we tried. And the, the implications that are pretty large, and I'm just saying, I don't think they're in the market right now. Yeah. Alan, time. you must deal with negative tail risk all the time. So I think that's um, the point uh, that's been made regarding it's very difficult with geopolitical risk to, to price those tail risks correctly. And I don't think that the stock market in the US is really uh, not doing so well because of what you said. But I, I think that the Russia thing is more risky than people realize. It's not just because of oil prices, mm -hmm. because if for some reason Russia uh, was dropped from uh, global indices or there was pressure on U.S. investors to sell their Russian assets, um, then that would cause a mini, uh, that would cause some serious financial issues, mm -hmm. much more than just the oil price going on. So, I think when you have uh, history shows, when you have um, people in charge, anyone in charge of of, a, of um, a country and institution, they can sometimes make decisions which are not rational, and we have to watch very carefully. And in this case, um, so far. We've just seen uh, Russia continuously push, push, and the U.S. Uh, response has been not, not, str not, not strong enough yet. But if it does, for whatever reason, decide to do the things I mentioned, then I think we'll get a real accident. I mean, we, have to, we have to watch. Yeah. I, th mm -hmm. I think the, the, and we're off, maybe off the investment thing a little bit, but you know, one of the worries is, <coughs> in theory, Russia is playing a strategic game, and the Western powers are playing a tactical game, and they're reacting against it. And those are the two different stories um, at play, so it, it's, it's hard to predict. Yep. Well, there's, there's a couple more topics I'd like to try and get us on to. And one is about fragile sentiment, because we've talked about the economic recovery, the market recovery we've seen from the financial crisis. In spite of those years of recovery, market sentiment does feel pretty shaky in most of the world. It feels 
you know, it doesn't take too much to tip equity markets into a bad day. And, uh, you know, participation in the equity market by individuals remains very low. You know, at this point in a bull market, you'd usually have people coming in in very large amounts from the retail market. Well, it ain't happening this time. And, uh, you know, the, the regulation or lack of it or the style of regulation seems to me to have contributed to the shaky sentiment. Um, I don't know, Terry, if you've got any thoughts on that from where you sit. Well, a few. Regulation is something that's always difficult because what regulation breeds is you have no confidence in the market because of the uncertainty of what the regulators could or could not do. So we're looking at Dodd-Frank from 2008, 2009 being implemented in 2010. The SEC still has about 70% of the rules they haven't even written yet. The CFTC is through about 70% of the rules. Mm -hmm. So participants understand that. Participants have been burned, and now they haven't come back into the marketplace. So you look at young people today, where they're going, and I think that's the future of everything we do in life. It's all about the young people. They're not going into the financial services sector. Instead, what they're hearing is all the bad things around the financial services sector. So who in the hell would want to invest? Yeah. So I think the confidence is shaken for a lot of reasons. And a lot of it is, is, is well just. And, ho and unfortunately, the market is up significantly and everyone's missed that. That's the sad part about it. Yeah. The market is bigger than some of the ebbs and flows that we have. You know, up, like I said earlier, we're up 500% in 25 years in the marketplace. So Dodd-Frank didn't cause that not to happen. You know, the flash crash didn't just cause that not to happen. People need to have a longer term horizon. The problem with young folks today is their horizon is about 30 seconds. Yeah. And it's instant gratification. And that's just because of the society we live in. I have two young twin boys that are 10 years of age. And it's a whole different world than when I grew up where we had a little bit longer horizon. The markets are really shaken from that. Yeah, you make a really important point, I think, about young people. People in their 20s don't buy homes and they don't buy shares. No. They don't buy, I mean, the, the, the motor industry is really deep down very worried because they don't buy those big expensive SUVs. They tend to be reurbanizing and living differently. So I think you make a very important point we ought to think about strategically. I think it's really important that we give credibility back to the marketplace. And when I say that, it's no different than the HFT argument that we're hearing right now. If people are doing things that are basically front-running people, we need to stop that, we need to correct that, we need to put those people in jail. Yeah. You know, electronic trading, things of that nature are all good for the marketplace. The ecosystem is very important. Otherwise, I guarantee anybody that's in the financial services industry, if they don't have the whole ecosystem, you won't do as well because spreads widen, yeah. cost of business goes up. Yeah. We need to give confidence to the marketplace. We need to help the regulators catch the bad guys and, and put everybody back in the market. Individuals have been exiting the market for the last 10 or 15 years. If you look at money flows, it was interrupted a little bit by the Fed, you know, pushing lots of money into the system. and. But, but basically, for a while, people have thought that the markets were rigged. Yeah. You know, that the, that the pros had an edge. And, and, you know, people got burned in a number of these. They got burned, you know, in the last crisis. They got burned in previous crises. So I think the Fed had done a, an okay job. At, it felt like breaking that psychology by just forcing people. You know, when the stock market goes up 30%, you know, people start to take notice, but, it, but, it, but it, it's, it, it's a question of, like, is it sustainable? Given the power of the stock exchange, stock exchanges to be the best allocator of equity capital around the economy, isn't that really a long-term pretty dangerous diagnosis? Well, the problem with some of the exchanges, too, is it's so fragmented, so you're not even seeing the price of the actual product. Forty percent of the of the U.S. equity market trades in dark pools, so we don't even see what the cost of that value is. And then the lit exchanges are the other 60 percent, so much is internalized, only about 12 to 15 percent is actually being traded on exchanges today. So the real price, I think this goes back to the confidence issue. And I'm not just talking in the book because I have a different model that I operate in, but if people don't know what the real value is, they're going to think there's something up. But when you see the real value of something, I think people can participate. Yeah. Alan, from a European point of view, anything? Yeah, I think for us, it's much more a question of how can regulators do a better job. And I think there's a few things they could consider doing to improve things. The first thing is, you know, there's a lack of, we need more clarity from regulators. There's always, a, there's a lack of predictability in how the rules uh, uh, come out. Secondly, harmonization. The SEC and the FSOC, for example, don't always share data between each other. And it's possible that funds may have to uh, clear swaps in Europe and US. 
Um, if you look at um, consistency, look at the CIFI rules. They're much harsher on US uh, banks than on Asian banks, and similarly on funds versus banks as well, even though banks don't have, um, don't, uh, have deposits. Um, and really, when you look at for, for CIFI rules for funds, it should be much more based on activities and other than funds itself. If they start putting CIFI yeah. rules on, banks, on funds, you're just going to see money move from one fund to CIFI to another. And similarly with processes, I think it's much better when they, when they decide, if the CFTC or someone decides they, about a rule that's going to come out, they need to give us time for feedback uh, and for comments and not just um, potentially come up with rules just using guidance, because, which means there's no comments, they just give you guidance. And what's happened recently with the CFTC, you've had a lot of no action, let, no action letters delaying some of those rules. So there's a few things they could do to improve things. Yeah, and you know, your point about uh, bank oversight and CIFIs is topical today with Bank of America's problems and having to re recut their, their, ca their capital strategy. You know, effectively a rap on the knuckles from the Fed, rather like City had a couple mm -hmm. of weeks ago. But uh, James, just one point, I don't think uh, there's a clear linkage between the regulatory reform and the, the market sentiments. I, I, I would say, if you're looking for the last year, right, the regulatory reforms really push you forward. But if you're looking for the equity market in these countries, in the Europe, financial sector is, is doing extremely well, mm -hmm. right? And uh, so these are two separate different things. And for the regulatory reform, we just finished only the small portion of the whole thing, Basel three implementation is still the key issue because this is not sort of consistently implemented in all the countries across the board. But there are a few key battles we still need to move forward. Cross-border resolution mechanism, which is the key, which is the big issues cause the concern in 2008 financial crisis. Uh, the derivative regulations also big issues as well. So I think we need to move forward agendas and make sure the implementation is there on Basel III and also uh, carry on the field regulations reform as well. Thank you, Min. Uh, maybe in the last five minutes, I'd like to go on to something that's preoccupied me quite a lot as an old Japan buff. I, I, I actually 30 years ago used to manage Japanese equity portfolios and still have quite an affection for the place. Um, obviously the last 20 years in the Japanese economy have been brutal deflation, there have been lack of progress, lack of growth. And uh, Prime Minister Abe, when he came in, introduced what's now known as Abenomics. And in the old samurai tradition, there were three arrows to be fired. And the three arrows for Mr. Abe were monetary policy, fiscal policy, and structural reform. Well, they made a pretty good start with the first two, but fiscal policy seems to have gone into reverse with the increase in sales tax. And monetary policy seems to be caught in inaction. So maybe they've only got one bent arrow left. And uh, I, I do get concerned that the big success last year of Abenomics may be right now in question. Uh, Alex, any thoughts? Well, I'm mean, poor Japan. I think they've tried well over a dozen stimulus programs since 2000, and they're they're battling the hardest thing possible, which is a you know a mindset issue. I guess I, I think my, people expect the central bank to solve everything, and that's pricing in the market now. So the BOJ doesn't have much choice from where I sit. They'll have to ease again, but that won't solve the problems. And by the way, I don't expect them to ease this week. I think they're going to wait a while to see what the consumption tax implications are. That won't solve their problems. They can't depreciate their currency into salvation. And I agree, I think they can only do so much fiscal stimulus. So they're back to the hardest one, which is structural reform. And I expect they'll knock down their corporate tax rate from 35 to 25 or 28 percent, which will hopefully allow wages to go up. Yeah. And then they'll start doing more around free trade zones. They might introduce gambling. They need to get more competitive in a bunch of industries that aren't competitive, and that's really hard to do. Yeah, the increase in the corporate tax, the decrease that you're suggesting in the corporate tax rate would be a really good move to negate the fiscal contraction that comes from the goods and services tax. But the risk, and, and this is worth putting on the table since we, we talk about tail risk, the risk is a massive one, and that is that they do succeed in stimulating some kind of inflation, and they fail in terms of stimulating growth. Yep. And then given the amount of debt that Japan has, you have in theory the potential for what I would call Abageddon, a run on the Japanese debt markets, yep. and that would be a disaster. Yeah, stagflation would be horrible for the, for the debt levels. Yeah, and for Japan, I think the key issue is they have to move the growth from sort of a stimulus-driven growth to a sustainable growth. I think yeah. that's the key issue because in the past 18 months, exactly what you mentioned, uh, it's yeah. very much a monetary policy, fiscal policy support, right, mm -hmm. uh, which, is, which is fine. But now have to move to sustainable growth, which means you need to perform the broad structural reforms 
the labour market reforms and also for the dealer regulation on the service sectors and agro, open field sectors to join the, the global competitions. I think that those things will facilitate the long-term sustainable growth for Japan, which is key. Yeah. So, uh, so I think for us, the, the TPP is the key issue. We go, uh, we're not going to get that much from the structural reforms on the third arrow. But if the TPP comes through, that will potentially increase the, uh, the, the long-term growth rate of Japan. And the second thing is that the BOJ is really just targeting inflation. And in its last report, it's come out saying that it's going to increase its forecast of inflation for 15, which does mean that they don't think that they need to do that much more at the moment. Um, so, from a, so I think um, so they think that they've succeeded at this at this state, and that they think the output gap is narrowed completely, uh, or, or call narrowing. So we may so from that from an inflation point of view, they may not be doing as much as people think right now. So the next kick most probably will be from the GPIF, uh, which. Um, if, if you see uh, them moving uh, the, uh, to another department, another department within, the, within the government, that could increase the amount of um, uh, uh, additional stock or purchasing out of bonds. I tend to think, though, that the uh, yen, which Alex mentioned, is really important because, to me, the, the great um, villain of the 20 years of deflation in Japan was a structurally overvalued yen which was to do with domestic savings. And uh, with this, with the overvalued yen actually caused a deindustrialization of Japan. They don't make cars, they don't build televisions like they used to, and that's because they became an expensive place to do business. So maybe the yen is actually the, 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 the thing well, to look for. I live in Switzerland, and I can tell you, you know, it's really hard to get a cheaper currency in a place like Switzerland or Japan when there's scary stuff in the headlines. So maybe yeah. if Putin is quiet, the yen will go down. Yeah, absolutely. We've covered a lot of ground. Is there any topic panelists think we absolutely should cover, but we haven't? No. With that, I'd thank you for your fortitude early in the morning and listening. Thanks very much.